So what am I going to do? I, uh, where were we? I don't think we need to recap, right? Do we? Um, uh, so goal, the bottom bullet point, right? Um, what I was going to do is talk about Alexandra's work very quickly um, and then move on to the head touch, uh, move on to probability and LP. Um, okay, the head touch task. So an infant, a 14 month old pre-verbal infant is sitting on its mother's knee facing an experimenter across a table. Right? And the experimenter has this nifty looking light box which has a huge button on the top, which if you press your hand on, it lights up and it plays a jingle, I think. It's really interesting stuff. Right? And there are four There are four conditions. So either the, so we're talking about the experimenter now. Mother is just supportive. The experimenter either has her hands free, so she does this, waves them about, makes sure that the infant can see that she's got hands, uh, or she has a, sh a shawl wrapped around her. She says, oh, I'm cold, wraps a shawl around her, which she has to hold with two hands. Right? Or one hand. She has to hold with one hand. Right, get it right. Um, so that's the difference between hands free and hands occupied. Communicative, she makes various, the signals that carers make to infants of 14 months that uh, there's something to pay attention to. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to teach you something. I'm going to communicate with you. Or in the, in the incidental condition, she doesn't. She doesn't actually specifically acknowledge the existence of the infant. Right? And okay, what can, uh, what the experimenter does is puts on the light either by reaching out, pressing the switch, the light goes on in the hands-free condition, right? or with a hands on the shawl, they are both hands on the shawl, right? She leans down on the table and presses the button with her forehead. That's the head touch task, right? And infants find that extremely interesting, right? Um, but you notice that, so this is, this is originally called imitation, it's an imitation task, right? So the question is, how does the, how does the infant imitate? And the answer is that in the communicative task, with hands occupied, then the infant just reaches out with their hand and touches, despite the fact that the experimenter did it with the head. Right? But with hands free, right, um, yeah, let me get this the right way around. Uh, with hands free, the infant actually reaches first and then does it by a head touch. Right. But it's the, it's the frequency of head touching that the particularly thing. So basically, right, all infants show evidence of learning the function of light box. They probably knew the function of light. I mean, they're used to switching things on, right? Uh, anyway, but this, it's a, a neat new light box and it plays a jingle as well and the light goes on, right? So, I mean, this is important stuff. But the interesting question is, when do they imitate the peculiar way of doing it, which is almost certainly novel, right? right? So they learn, everybody learns the new means, but only when the adult's hands are not involved in another goal-directed activity, right? And where the adult communicates that they're going to communicate something. Right? So careful observation is that the infant almost always does the hand thing first. They do the regular thing first, but then, as you see, this is psychology, right? So it's percentages, but you see that there's a very considerably larger percentage of people uh, of, of infants who 
imitate when it's communicated and um, the experimenter's hands are free so she could have done it the regular way. And this is about how you model this in LP. The reason why the logic is LP is sometimes called planning logic. Right? It was invented by the AI uh, fraternity for doing planning. You plan with respect to your best guess model of the situation that you're in, right? not according to uh, classical logic. You don't worry about the fact the uh, Earth's gravitational constant might change in the next second or two and everything, everybody float off into the room. Right? That's something you just don't worry about. Um, so it's non-monotonic. Planning is non-monotonic. You ever tried doing anything complicated and all sorts of things intervene? Right? That's planning. Um, so there's uh, goal hypothesis formation, uh, hypothesis testing, and there's plan simulation and plan recognition. So one of these is forward re plan simulation is forward reasoning. Right? If I press the lights, I press the switch, then the light goes on. Um, if plan recognition is this business of recognizing that, um, for example, that she planned to put the light on but couldn't do it with her hand, so she did it with her head. Right? And you need, I mean, okay, it, it's obvious, right? It's obvious what's going on, perhaps, with hindsight, maybe. But it takes a lot of machinery to actually get uh, it to happen, to explain what, is, what it is that's necessary. And I think that's the moral. I mean, we're in the paradoxical situation of claiming that the logic is, you know, people are very good with this logic. Even 14-month-olds, right, are highly rational according to a lot of uh, criteria in what they're doing and they're making this actually quite complicated uh, reasoning about two goals, two simultaneous goals and all the rest of it. So it's something unlike classical logic, it's something that people are incredibly good at, right? They're very good at understanding stories, right? But you need an awful lot of technical machinery to capture it. Right? And then lots of disputes about whether it does exactly capture it. Uh, I don't think you should be at all surprised at that. Right? If you, I mean, the alternative psychological theories talk about, well, the infant resonates with the situation. Right? And you know, so imitation is a low-level re resonance phenomenon. Well, I think this shows that it's not a low-level resonance phenomenon. Right? It's actually something that you, it's very difficult to explain why holding a shawl around your neck right, will uh, affect the infant's uh, you know, imitations. Right? Um, I'm, but I'm going to skip, right? So LP is something which naturally handles goals. If you look at the extensional systems, we're going to come on to probability, they don't handle goals, they handle preferences. And okay, technically you can dress preferences up as if they were goals, right? But um, what Kowalski and company in inventing the system show is that you need both what are called maintenance goals, things like staying alive, right? Staying warm. If you're a 14 month old, learning everything you can get your hands on. Um, and understanding what mother's communicating to you, all of these are maintenance goals, right? They tend to be around, not necessarily always, but they're around a lot of the time. And then you've got achievement goals, which are things that you can actually do at a certain time in a certain situation in order to, in order to restore a maintenance situation or, uh, or whatever, right? Uh, so you need this two-level system and what Alexandra shows quite nicely is you can have the same inferential engine working, but um, you need that 
apparatus, quite a lot of apparatus, in order to get this simple thing out of pre-verbal infants. There's nothing particularly verbal about LP. I mean, when I do it, I talk about what the child's saying to itself. The child isn't saying anything to itself, right? They're not talking. Um, but it's very difficult to describe without putting words into their mouth. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a logic which naturally handles goals, goal-directed behavior. I think it's therefore a very good logic for getting into issues about motivation. Right? And there is a sense in which goals are much more basic than preferences. Your goals change, yeah, sure, but they don't change as rapidly as preferences do uh, in general. Right? All right, so the, the bottom line is that indeed this is inferential imitation. The child is making inferences. It's, making, it's doing closed world reasoning. Uh, rather just as it will be doing discourse processing in the next year or so. Okay, so this is what I'll, I will end up with. This is current work. This is work joint with Laura Martignon in the Berlin uh, MPI, so Gigerenz's outfit. And the goal is to produce a probability-free model of judgment, right? Judgment and decision is not a field that I've worked in, at least for a very long time. Uh, judgment and decision is dominated completely by probability. And when the psychologists of reasoning took it over, they adopted probability uh, with the whole uh, shooting match. We would like them to be a lot more precise about just what it is that the subject is supposed to be doing when they're reasoning. We want a process model, right? And we want it in the weakest formal system that is adequate. We think that's really important. If you're going to do experiments and try and test things, you want to use the weakest thing. You don't want to throw a system which has all the bells and whistles and will model anything. At it because succeeding in modeling it is not then telling you anything. Right? So that's the spirit. The spirit behind it is trying to show that, that people can do something distinctively different from probability. It's not just an approximation to probability, it's something distinctly different, which has a lot to do with the co cooperative nature of the LP that we're using. Okay, so the brake pedal is pressed, the car slows down. This is an experiment due to Cummins. I think the reference comes up next. Um, 95. So we're repurposing an old experiment and interpreting it in a rather different way than uh, the original author did. So one day, all right, the brake pedal is pressed, the car slows down, is a, a knowledge-based conditional. Even the non-drivers among you know this conditional, I suspect. Right. One day the pedal was pressed, but the car did not slow down. So this is episodic input. Right. So the subject's task is to generate as many explanations of this failure of the regularity as you can. And it's emphasized, we're talking about your general knowledge. We're not talking about a mathematical puzzle of some sort or another. Right. What general knowledge do you have about which would explain what might have happened? Right. And they come up with things like, there's ice on the road. Right? The brake fluid leaked, and so on. They generate between, uh, well, between zero and maybe six or seven uh, defeaters per trial. So those are abnormalities. Right? Remember abnormalities? One day the car slowed down, but the pedal was not pressed. Right? So this is affirmation of the consequent reasoning. Right? And they generate... The accelerator was released, for example. Right? So the car slowed down if the road was flat and so on. All right, modus ponens inference is defeated by abnormalities. Affirmation of the consequent inference is defeated by alternative causes. I'm going to talk about, mostly about modus ponens, but the same, most of the same goes. Right? Cummins' task is a game of two halves. In her experiment, 
generation and judgment were done by two different groups of subjects, right? In an initial experiment in an area, you tend to use between subject designs because you want to rule out that doing one is affecting how the other one is done. In the extension we made, we do it within subject for reasons you'll hear, right? So the subject is told, generate as many broad explanations of this failure as you can, and broad is explained. Um, you're not supposed to say, you know, Harry um, got in the way, Fred got in the way, right? I mean, those are not two defeaters, they're counted as one, right? So you're not allowed to sort of artificially multiply defeaters. Uh, and then in the confidence uh, thing, our subjects do it either before or after. Um, in the confidence thing, then uh, they judge, you know, they're asked, uh, how confident would you be in drawing this conclusion from this conditional right. uh, on a scale of one to seven? So result, the number of defeaters generated inversely predicts the subject's confidence. Right? It's an absolutely uh, intuitive finding, no surprising. Right? We're interested in reasoning that subjects understand what they're supposed to be doing and they're good at. Right? That's a really good thing to study. Right? Um, in fast and frugal heuristic speak, who, who, you know what fast and frugal heuristics are? The MPI in Berlin, Gerd Gigerenzer has, and the ABC group have made a great deal of interesting progress in talking about non-probabilistic uh, non models for judgment and decision. But I've always had the trouble that the, the heuristics that they use, and you'll see examples of the heuristics, tallying is an example of a heuristic, right? Counting the number of defeaters, rather than having a linear model which weights them and multiplies and adds and so forth. Um, They have not managed to completely get away from probability because most of their heuristics require estimations of their validity and sometimes a ranking of their validity. How valid is this Q? And that's usually done prob probabilistically. So this tallying gets around that, right? You don't have to assess anything about frequency or probability. You simply look at the number of exceptions that you know. And surprisingly, even though they're all weighted the same, right, you just count them, uh, the number is highly predictive of a large proportion of the variance. Right? Okay, so note, this is a change of level from what I call vanilla discourse processing, which is what I was talking about. This is not a subject understanding a single episodic story about Linda or about the big bad wolf or whatever. Right? This is the, unusually having a database conditional uttered, right? something that doesn't usually happen because they usually remain implicit to be retrieved during text processing, um, and then to reply about how reliable conditionals are. So they're making a generalization about over some set of, uh, some set of scenarios and we don't know what those scenarios are. Right. So our extension is not very large. We change to a within subject design, and you'll see why we do that. Uh, and we ask for probabilities of defeaters. Why do we use probabilities when we don't believe they're probabilities? Well, you have to maximize the chances that if people do know about probabilities and then they produce something like a probability. Uh, I'm going to talk about them as likelihoods in a non-technical Anglo-Saxon sense of likelihood, right? Just to be agnostic. Right, we replicate Cummins very handsomely, right? So MP, we can predict 90% of the item variance. You take the means over the subjects uh, for the different conditional. There are 12 conditionals here all causal conditionals well known to the subjects. Um, 
we can look for other e evidence of other heuristics. I mean, the MPI group have a whole slew of different heuristics that people use in different circumstances, and they've done a lot of very good work on the ecology of when it's good. I mean, you talk about us matching logics to reasoning situations. They're matching uh, heuristics to decision situations. Um, but they don't have an account of how you find the cues, computational account of how, they, how you find the cues. Um, and they didn't have this way of assessing. Um, so we've looked at other heuristics. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. But the best cue is you simply take the most valid cue of the ones that you've got, right? the most valid defeater, and you ignore the, you ditch, ditch the rest of them. Right? Um, but you, we, this is what I call the first bite at frequency, right? because you need to know something about, you have to have something which tells you what they regard as the best cue. Um, there's a lot of nice work showing that uh, an awful lot of natural distributions actually lend themselves to one Q reasoning, right? And they make a lot out of the fact that ditching information and not doing regression or whatever the optimal, supposedly optimal procedure is can actually be very good. It's particularly good if you're not fitting models but predicting, predicting on what's going to happen in new data, right? And we think that's an important thing about probability models is that they tend to be rather brittle. Uh, I don't want to talk about what. Okay, a tale of two heuristics. I don't. I think I'm even going to. Uh, where are we? I'm even going to skip over this. Um, right. So we can make up equations predicting. I mean, what you're looking at is not information about how accurate they are. We have no idea how accurate they are. Right? What you're looking at is information about how coordinated they are across subjects. Right? Are they doing the same thing, but different things with different conditionals, according to the number of defeaters that they can generate for that conditional? OK. So Again, another thing we think about probability is that people are awfully cavalier about where the data comes from. I mean, okay, there are excellent exceptions, but um, where might frequency information come from? Right? Um, and we have a story about how LP nets will in fact generate intentionally loaded frequencies. Sometimes they will be correspond to the observed frequencies, but they will also be subject to all the things that Kahneman and Tversky talked about in terms of intentional influences. Um, right, and in a way the question here which we're after is, well, I mean the typical, typical probabilistic modeler just assumes that the subject has the distributions. And I don't think psychologically that's most of the meat is gone out the window. Where do you, where do you get your data from? Is, the, is a very pressing question. All right. So another analysis of our data um, is to look at, because we're collecting defeaters from the same subject as is making the judgments about the regularity, we can actually ask, when does this subject produce the same defeater as that subject, right? And we can look to see to what extent it has the same effects, right? So within subject designs are always much more powerful. They get rid of a lot of noise and they make comparisons possible. Whereas in the between subject task, I mean, is, you know, they never met each other. Right? The ones who do confidence never know anything about defeater generation, and the ones who do defeater generation never know anything about confidence. It, I mean, you have to show that the two tasks don't interfere with each other, and uh, that stuff sort of works out. Right? Okay, so the, this question we want to focus on is, does the, what is it that predicts the likelihoods? Right? 
and I have a contrast between process and product, right? Are they just getting it off the shelf? Well, some of the probabilists would have us. And these are all preformed. We have distributions for everything. Um, so we can identify the same defeater produced by different subjects, and we can look at the position in the sequence in which it's recalled. Right? And any memory theorist will tell you that the sequence of recall in this sort of task, and generation is, I mean, it's, a, it's not what's normally meant by recall, but it's generation. Um, that sequence is incredibly important. It's one of the main memory phenomena. I mean, there are just stacks and stacks and stacks of, uh, of papers on, and, and different models of the, the, um, the curves that you get. Right? So, for instance, the first observation is that the cue that the defeater that people rate most highly in their likelihood judgments is more often than not, 80% of the time, it's the first out. Right? Well, you can think of that about, say, well, it's the first out because it's the most, the best cue, right? Or perhaps it's the best cue because it's first out. Right? And there's a lot of work again at the MPI showing that these memory uh, heuristics play a, a very large role in people's reasoning. It's very difficult to separate the actual origin, nevertheless. Right? But you can do an analysis of variance on the identities of the defeaters, recalled, right? averaged over subjects, identity of defeater against where it's recalled and what you find is that two-thirds of the variance is determined by where it's recalled determined by statistically I mean you can't prove that that's cause right so this sequence of recall is two is twice as powerful a cue in terms of prediction as the the identity of the defeater Right? We're not suggesting that that's in any, any way irrational, but it may, it's certainly a pointer to where they're coming from. So this is just a look at that data. This is a, uh, I was having trouble with LaTeX. The left-hand graph is the data for the most, the six most commonest defeaters for each conditional. And the right-hand graph is the next six, so the seven to 12. So the left-hand graph is more, uh, is denser than the right-hand graph. And you can see that the curves are very systematic. You get this U-shaped curve in, um, on the left, and you get a, it's a sort of a U-shaped curve, but it, with a strong declining pattern with a less frequent defeaters. Um, right, so it's rather, I mean, uh, anybody who's worked on memory immediately would recognize the the phenomenon, right? And we can use, a, there's, a, there's something called the, um, uh, the competitive queuing model, which explains how you would take an LP net and get out a sequence, how you would do generation, right? how you would get out a sequence of uh, defeaters. And it has, has to do with outputting the most uh, activated one and then inhibiting it. Because if you don't inhibit it, it's going to keep coming out right? every time. It's going to be the most active one all the time. So you, you, you generate it and inhibit it. The process of generation actually inhibits it. And then you pick up the next one and you inhibit that one and the next one until you run out. Right? So it's called competitive queuing. Um, Okay, a probability-free model of judgment in non-monotonic non reasoning, right? So what have we done? Right? We stuck together LP and fast and frugal heuristics, and I didn't stop to say, you know, say how those things could be computed, but in a parallel spreading activation fashion, the frequencies come not from within the logic, but they come from monitoring the activity of the logic. 
So you're looking at frequencies of inference, not frequencies of occurrence. Right? But um, that's, we claim, a very plausible origin for the data that they're using. They also seem to have, they know a lot about how popular different defeaters are, right? Because that's even more predictive than their likelihood judgments, right? So we know, because we've got all the data, we can add up how often a defeater was produced. But they don't, I mean, they don't have access to that data. They, but I strongly suspect they know when they're producing one out of left field and where one, when one that the, everybody's going to produce, right? And that popularity rating is thoroughly intentional information, I think, right? It's a, that's what intentional logic is about. What, are the, what does the community infer about things, right? It's this cooperative uh, logic again, right? What is the relation of this intentional model to probability, right? Well, as a graduate student uh, of Michiel's, who has just proved a thing called the structural common core theorem, which is for causal Bayes nets and LP nets. And it's, it's kind of work following on from the work that Pearl, Pearl conjectured that the structural part of a, B, of a Bayes net um, would uh, correspond in a certain way to uh, non-monotonic logic. He wasn't talking about LP, but never mind. So what uh, Ricardo has done is to show that for the causal subcase, anyway, uh, there's a common core. So the structural model derived by an LP system for a context will be what you want if you're going to construct a Bayesian model. What you have to add to it is the distributional information, right? In doing so, you completely change the computational properties because probability is horrible. I mean, okay, Guy has some really nice analogical fixes for some of the horribleness, but probability is ho pretty horrible computationally. Right? Um, so one could view LP nets as the framing that people have to do in order to set up a problem for statistical treatment, perhaps. Right. Right. So there's a very recent debate in thinking and reasoning. Uh, Mike Oxford and Nick Chater um, published a paper about dual systems, uh, which criticizes our notions of dual systems, which are admittedly quite unorthodox. Right? Um, and we replied. And in there, there's a, f uh, I think, quite a nice encapsulation of what's in common. There's a lot in common between the structural properties of Bayes nets and the, and the structural properties of LP nets. Um, so the inferential strength of a natural language conditional on either system is contextually determined, not compositionally. Right? So in that sense of intentional, probability is intentional. That's Pearl's sense of intentional. Right? It's not truth functional, right? but it is, it's, um, it's certainly not truth functional, but it's intentional. Right? It's intentional in the sense I was using, but not intentional in this sense. There's an inference pattern of the form, suppose that E is all the evidence at your disposal, then C follows. So when I described closed world reasoning, I talked about having to be able to search to demonstrate that you don't have any evidence about something, and then conclude that it's negation. Right? Negation is failure, failure to find. And you obviously have to have this uh, exhaustive notion of exhaustive search. That's very important in LP. In Bayes nets, if a variable or a proposition or whatever you want to call the units isn't in the net, then it isn't the cause. Right? So there's exactly the same absence of information is indicative of uh, a negation of some sort. Right? Um, and the third one is the Ramsey test. Right, so uh, 
Yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, closed world reasoning evaluates, uh, can evaluate conditional strength by asking what happens if you add uh, something to the current model. And that mirrors uh, Bayesian updating in one way or another. So there's a lot in common. There are also very distinctly different. The, the computational profiles are almost opposite. LP is immediate anytime inference. As soon as the information arrives, you're going to use it, which is what the psycholinguistics literature bears out. That's how discourse processing operates. You don't wait till the end of one of Proust's sentences before you look up the lexical items in the, in the sentence. Right. Um, so Peter Haggot at the MPI in um, Nijmegen has done, is the name that's associated with that work. Um, we're interested in this question about, okay, if people are, they've got to do an LP thing to set up a probability model anyway. The empirical question becomes, well, when do they need to go any further? When do they need to decorate these things with distributions? When could they decorate them with distributions? And again, this plea for the weakest system that you can get. Right? Um, so, I mean, this is an analogy, right? If you take arithmetic, right, there's school arithmetic, I mean, you know, eight-year-old arithmetic, school arithmetic, which you can do the shopping with, right, you do addition and subtraction. Um, but school arithmetic is not number theory, right? That's not what Gödel in the last talk uh, proved was incomplete, right? It's utterly decidable, uh, and there are any number of weak arithmetics which uh, logicians have made up, and it might not even be a, a whole logic, it might just be a collection of algorithms or something, right? Seeing probability as a monolithic thing is like thinking of school arithmetic as number theory, right? Kolmogorov probability has a whole bundle of stuff that you need, and you don't want to you don't want anything that you don't need, is the slogan, right? If you want to make empirical discriminations about what people are using, then it's very important to model in the weakest system, right? Okay, so... Uh, and we have written a good deal about why the computational profile is, of probability is wrong uh, for discourse processing. Right? So they need to find out when people go beyond simple intentional models and where the data comes from to do so. So we have a proposal about the data, but notice it's not straightforward observations of the statistical, one of the slogans is the statistical structure of nature. Right? I mean, that's not what people have got, I think. There's a discussion in the, in the thinking and reasoning thing about the flightlessness of penguins. Right? You have zero, I suspect, useful first-hand observation of the flightlessness of penguins. That is to say, you, the conditions under which you see them, they wouldn't be flying even if they could. Right? So, right. Um, unfortunately, uh, Sloman is not, is not here. He was here yesterday. This is very frustrating. Um, he and David Lagnado, who's also not here because he was here the day before, right, have a very nice review of Bayesian reasoning. I think of them as digging the same tunnel from the other end. And I think they're very honest operators. I mean, they, they come to the conclusion that it's very important that Bayesnets don't or can't do narrative processing. There are claims in the literature they don't accept any of the claims in the literature. Right. They, don't, they, they don't seem to understand what the nature of the data is that they've got to meet. Um, right. So uh, I think this is very 
encouraging. I mean, we begin to get some, some sort of a picture about you know, all these things are specialists. Probability is a specialist system. It's a, you know, one way of saying it is, well, it's for understanding the stochastic properties of causal processes and ca causal, in causal cases anyway. I don't know about other cases. All right, so I think there's, there's progress to be made. Um, okay, the, this is just summary. Uh, I hope we've still got some time left, right? Um, just for amusement at the end, right? You're supposed to end with some morals, right? Mor morals is a pun. Right? Um, Wason and Linda are probably the two most famous errors in human reasoning, judgment, and decision. Right? If you just count up the papers published on them, and according to our argument, you may or not, may not accept the argument, but you ought to produce some counter-arguments, right? Uh, according to our argument, what they betray is not an error in the subject's reasoning, but a blindness on the part of experimenters to intentional reasoning. And intentional reasoning is an incredibly important part of what humans do. Right? Extensional reasoning is always framed in intentional reasoning. Uh, there's a lovely paper by, by Moldovano and Langer in Psych Review from a psychological perspective on why, you know, when you set up a, stati a statistical model, you have to do it in an intentional framework. Right? Which car's brake pedals are we talking about? All the ones in the car park? Right? If you press those, it doesn't, they don't slow down. Right? So the probability is going to rock it down. That's, right? it's, it's perfectly obvious to the subjects. You know, if you ask them, well, what about the ones in the car park? What about the ones on the dump? They just look at you and they say, yeah, I mean, you're really stupid, aren't you? Right? I mean, right? They apply immediately a whole bunch of intentional reasoning about what's the stereotypical situation in which somebody's driving a car down a, down a road uh, and they press the brake pedal, right? Um, you can't capture that stuff extensionally, I, I would argue. Um, right? A phobia for intentional reasoning, I think. Right? It's not proper reasoning. I mean, you still get that. Well, I've heard that at this meeting. Right? Psycholinguistics. Yuck! Right? Um, I... I Apart from disagreeing about the superficiality of logic, I agree with, a, I think, Valerie, um, uh, Valerie Rayner's talk yesterday was right on song, at a very different level. I mean, she was talking about very generalized notions of gist and this, that, and the other. This would be a very precise example of some of the things that she could be talking about. And it would be interesting to compare the autistic results on this. But you've got to take, you know, discourse processing is just an extraordinarily important part of human cognition. And experimental psychology uh, doesn't, you know, do without it. We had an interesting discussion, Ulrich and I, at lunch, about whether we could produce a completely non-verbal reasoning task. And I'm inclined to think you probably could, but it's not easy. Not at all easy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the infants in Alexandra's experiment are doing, well, Gergely's experiments are doing uh, reasoning without verbal instructions. Right. All right. So I think we have the beginnings of an account of how intentional and extensional systems are related to each other, perhaps through, I mean, it's only an example, I didn't claim that it's a general theory of anything, but it could be that you're, you have an LP net which runs all the time interpreting the stuff that life throws at you, and you can't turn off. Very hard to turn it off. You try not understanding a sentence in your native language which somebody utters. It's very, very difficult to, to do. Right? It's like don't think about alligators. Right? I mean, it's uh, an impossible instruction. Right? Um, and then you, can, you get a model at the end of the, of the discourse and 
you can then say, oh, right, I have probabilities for that, perhaps, or not. There are some things in the literature which strongly suggest you don't have the whole of Kolmogorov probability. So it would be nice to have talked about the hospital problem. But, um, right? And you're sitting there, I suspect, saying, I can't be a logician and a psychologist. Right? Well, you will have noticed, right, this is encouragement, right? You will have noticed that I'm not a logician and a psychologist. I'm absolutely not a logician. I'm a consumer of logical stuff that Michiel tells me. And I believe, and I certainly, uh, I mean, sometimes I might even be able to do a proof, but you're lucky. That's not what's crucial. What's really crucial is to understand, and, and it takes a long time and a lot of patience on his part, to really understand what it is that this formal result means in terms of the applications that you want to make from it. So you may not be able to become a logician if you're a psychologist, or a psychologist if you're a logician. There's a lot of stuff about running experiments which is equally arcane, uh, equally, equally arcane, right? But you can find one another. So thank you very much for your attention.